morning, everybody, and welcome to this meeting, this presentation by George Philip Busher, by organized by the Fitburg Historical Society. Uh, George is a Fitburg Bay resident, has been for many years, but has lived down here in this neck of the woods, the Western Cape, for virtually ever since he arrived in, in South Africa 50 years ago, and has been with our forestry department on and off years, but certainly looking after our, our, our forestry heritage for 50 years. Um, uh, did he have to <coughs> have that name designed for him? I'll leave that to George to explain to you. <laughs> George von the Busher, what David Hawkeen is saying, did George have to have a name like von the Busher? <laughs> Which I think is self-explanatory. Maybe George changed his name to von the Busher, or maybe because he had the name von the Busher, he, he decided to go into forestry. George will tell you. But anyway, I have no compunction, but you introduce you to George, who will talk to you about the heritage of the, of the uh, forest in the Zitzikama, and also up at Louis uh, and he'll tell you a few other things also about our forests. George? Thank you very much, David. Uh, Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, may I please ask first uh, that I, you have patience and I answer David. Um, the story of the history of my, the name of my family is a very, very long one. So I can come another time and talk for about half an hour about it. <laughs> but I think it would be a little too boring for you at this stage. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is a great privilege and honor for me to talk to you today after I have the privilege. 17 years ago already we talked to the Historical Society of Lettenberg Bay. At that time I talked on the history of the forest. Some of you might remember that, I don't know. Um, today I would like to concentrate on the people who worked in these forests, the people who were able to secure that we today still can enjoy the largest continuous indigenous forest of southern Africa. You might probably know that most of other indigenous forests, particularly of higher up north, have been um, clear felled, converted to agriculture and over exploited. But our Nisenat Sikama indigenous forest is the largest continuous indigenous forest we have got in southern Africa still there. I would like to uh, speak about different forest men who work here. Unfortunately, I can't mention any particular lady, but I can confirm to you that most of them were fantastically supported by their wives, if you accept that as a contribution to the ladies around here. I would like to particularly talk about the early foresters and then about the conservators, later on and about the scientists. These are these different kind of people who hope that these forests which we have today are in such a good order. Next, please. I mentioned uh, that these indigenous forests we have here are the evergreen uh, mountain forests. They are closely related to the tropical forests in the Amazon. Some of the uh, species we have here do not occur in the, in the Amazon forest, but they are this belonging to the same genus. So they are basically originated from the same back or historical or ancient background of, of, uh, of trees. They are all, with very few exceptions, evergreen, they are continuous, and we have here in the Southern Cape approximately 100 different species of, of trees. I mentioned already to you that it is the largest complex of natural forests in southern Africa and is about over 60,000 hectares, of which most of it is protected still today uh, by conservation agencies, in this case here now by sand parks, but they're all still owned by the state. And we're coming back to that particular aspect, which is very important that we have got the state owned as indigenous forests. To come to the exploitation, 
this basically started already around 1750, coming from the west, from the George area, and moving slowly uh, over to uh, the Lettenberg Basin's Parma area later on in the 19th century. This my particular wish for you to explain to you how dedicated men came from all over the world. They came from Scotland, they came from uh, uh, Ireland, and probably from Ireland, from England, from Sweden, from Germany, from Switzerland, to work here in these forests and to secure well, that we can still enjoy them today. We are also grateful that sand parks the National Parks Authority is now controlling most of the indigenous forests which are on state forest land and I can assure you that they're doing so far an excellent job of securing the extent, and the beauty and the value of these forests. I will mention only about half of all these ama amazing people who have worked here in these forests and some of you will say, why didn't you mention that person, why didn't you mention that person? That is a particularly personal attitude of mine that I would like to draw your attention to some outstanding people, I personally think, who did a lot for these forests. The first person who can be mentioned is Sir Carl Peter Thunberg. He was a Swede and he was a pupil of Carl Linnaeus. He later on became a professor and was a successor of Carl Linnaeus. He was an eminent botanist. He was here uh, in the 18th century and was sent by the Dutch East Indian Company from Cape Town to explore the inland forests because the Cape had no forests then anymore. He reported back and he said there is plenty of timber in these forests um, from George on towards, towards the east. And that encouraged the Dutch East Indian Company to uh, encourage their free burgers, these um, employees of the Dutch East Company who after a couple of years of service were able to do their own thing, to move here into this area and start cutting the forest. That harvesting uh, was concentrated basically in the area of George and later on between George and Leisner in the upland plateau area and apparently hundreds of free burgers and other people moved in there, cut the timber, made uh, planks and wood out of it and shipped it with ox wagons towards to the Cape or it was also shipped out of Mossel Bay or it was of course used for local use here. This was a complete uncontrolled um, operation until um, Joachim von Plettenberg arrived here in Plettenberg Bay in uh, 1787 and decided not only to call this beautiful place after himself, which was a normal thing to do in these days, um, but he also decided that the timber in this area around must be utilized for the Cape and uh, proposed that a control post was going to be established here and the timber be shipped out from Plettenberg Bay to the Cape. Um, the first person who was appointed here was J.F. Meeling. He was appointed here already in 1787 and he was the first kind of conservator for the forest as such because he controlled the woodcutters in these forests. He got very good support from the local farmers who were settling here, had settled here already, and he made contact with the woodcutters that they had to deliver the timber all to him, and he saw to it that only at certain areas, at certain times, these woodcutters were uh, supposed to harvest the trees. Uh, he controlled it very, very strictly. He was a Prussian, by the way. I'm not a Prussian, in case somebody thinks that. <laughs> and um, he was regarded, very highly regarded by the, the government authorities. And it was recorded that from a lot of visitors during that time that he did an amazing amount of control work that the forests were not completely 
completely denuded, but only the utilizable trees been taken out. And uh, during his time, of course, the, uh, the local timber shed was erected, as most of you will know, um, and uh, he was controlling the erection of that timber shed. The most amazing thing about this man is that he didn't only work for the Dutch East Indian Company, but when the first English occupation came here, he, was, he carried on to be the local resident. Then came the Batavian Republic, he was still retained, and later on, uh, after 1806, when he um, became again an English colony, British colony, he was still retained and stayed on as a resident until 1813. Once he um, stopped uh, operating here, he moved down to uh, the area of Setchfield and lived with his son and died over there. The control of the forest was going over to the British Admiralty and they established the Neisner Harbour um, and started shipping timber out from there. But there was no control anymore about the woodcutters. The woodcutters, less them, they were poor people. They worked very hard. They just took any timber which was utilizable without any control. Until the arrival of another amazing person, this was Captain Christopher Harrison. Uh, he was involved in uh, the Amakosa uh, Wars in the Eastern Cape and was then appointed um, in 1856 at Witt Ellsworth. Most of you will know it. It's very much on the eastern side of the forest, of, of the Tsitsikama forest. And he started there to implement the first controlled system of, um, of working these forests. He decided that the woodcutters were only allowed to cut in certain areas and then the forest had to rest for a long period. He actually suggested 80 years. This system of his wasn't really approved by the government, but he implemented it quite religiously. Uh, also later on, when we, he became the first conservator of forests at Neisner. Um, that from that time, time on, as from <coughs> 1874, the uh, resident foresters at Neisner were called conservator of forests. Already interesting that at that stage, even though most of the activities were concentrating on the harvesting of timber, but the name Conservator of Forest was already created to give power to the incumbent, incumbent of these parts to see that these forests are not completely denuded. His uh, main effort was, he worked as a Conservator of Forest for a very long time, and uh, Many people, particularly in Eisner, are descendants of, of, of Christopher Harrison. I know some of the teas and family, etc., are very closely related to Captain Harrison. Um, and he introduced also a, a new system. This is so called the section system. The section system came forward from his original plan that the woodcutters were only allowed to work certain areas in the forest which could be controlled by its rangers. The next amazing person who came here to South Africa and he was actually stationed in Cape Town was Count de Vazelo de Venier. Most of you will know that we have got a very nice, beautiful nature reserve between the crags and the Hrotrifia stretching from the sea as you can from Forest Hall to Nature's Valley and from the sea up into the mountain called the De Vazelo Nature Reserve. Now you probably will hear some of you why it was called De Vazelo Nature Reserve because uh, the Forest Authority or authorities, it was actually a friend of mine, when we created this nature reserve, we believe that this man, um, Vazelo, was the main man who started professional forestry in these indigenous forests. He was a Frenchman and was actually in charge of all the forests of the Cape from 1881 to 1992. 
His title was superintendent of Woodland Forest. He had only one big drawback. He was a Frenchman. There are not many Frenchmen here. They inclined to be a little bit arrogant, so he never learned to speak English. Not only did he speak English, he just couldn't write English either. And he had an assistant, um, Mr. Hayward, who later on became a uh, conservator, who was also trained in France as a forester, who had to translate everything this kind of Fazolo uh, was producing. Very quickly, what he all did, first of all, he introduced for the first time a systematic system of forestry by producing in 1883, the first forest regulations. Regulations mean basically the management principles of how these forests have to be operated. Then he produced later on the, manage, the actual management plan, and what is most important, in 1888, the first Forest Act. The, our Forest Act today, or the re most recent one, from 1998, has, has still got many features of this original Forest Act produced by was a lot. Um, what, what his other great achievement was that he had a lot of young um, foresters, trained foresters, mainly trained in, in, uh, in, in France also, but also later on in Edinburgh and Oxford, to come and work for him as district forest officer. So the superintendent is the, the big boss, then comes a conservator forest, and then these are the district foresters. And we will hear later on about all these other chaps. He trained, and uh, under his guidance, this new, new system of forest management was um, really uh, introduced, which in principle we still work today. His main effort again was that only certain sections of the forest were supposed to be worked at one time that the woodcutters were forced to go in a particular area for a year and then had to move out of the area so that the forest could be generated. And the second most important aspect of this was that the woodcutters were not allowed to kind of cut anything utilizable around there, but they were advised by the forestry staff which trees they had to take out, meaning the diameter of the trees to be removed were very much restricted. Then, after him, yeah. because he never learned to speak English, they didn't renew his contract, and he moved on to uh, French-speaking West Africa and became a very important forester there. His uh, follower, um, or the follower of, of uh, Captain Harrison and Eisen as conservator, was uh, Mr. D. Hutchins. He invented or implemented another important aspect of the conservation of our forests today because he established a system which was approved by Parliament in Cape Town that all state forests are going to be demarcated. They were demarcated in accordance to the surveys which were done by Fourcair, which we come later to, and that, that these survey and demarcated forest areas were not supposed to be sold or alienated without the approval of Parliament. The amazing thing is that this system is still today in operation. State land as such can be sold, as you probably know, but demarcated state forests and all our indigenous forests which are now managed by sand parks which belong to the state may not be sold to anyone without the rule of Parliament, which is of course very difficult and of course public participation is involved in that. This particular legal action of Mr. Hutchins <coughs> secured that our forests today have not been sold anymore. He was followed by Haywood. Um, he was, of course, as I mentioned before, he was the assistant of Count de Vazolo and was basically his interpreter. Um, what he basically did is he stopped the practice which was introduced by Captain Harrison and also by Hutchins, and that is the interplanting of the de destroyed indigenous forest with exotics. The interplanting of the indigenous forest with exotics, in particular with Blackwood, Australian Blackwood, Acacia, and Anoxodon, 
is a very important aspect of the conservation of our forests, and I will come back to this particular aspect. But first, I would like to draw your attention again to Fouquet. Fouquet was a Frenchman who came during the time of uh, uh, Count de Vazelo to South Africa, and he was uh, basically a surveyor, but he worked for a long time for de Vazelo and for Captain Harrison in the Eisner Forest, and he did the whole surveys. He surveyed all these sections according to which the forest was managed, and he was then basically the surveyor also for Hutchins to have all these forests declared democratic forests. He um, didn't have a forest training, and he went back into surveying after he was a district forest officer for a very short time. And he moved then later on in his life to the Tsitsikama, became a farmer, and later the first sawmiller at the Dells Boss. But his most outstanding contribution to science in South Africa is, first of all, he was the first one to develop aerial surveying systems. And he also introduced aerial surveying instruments, which were used by the British Admiralty. And lastly, for anyone who is interested in botany, he was an amazing botanist. He collected hundreds and thousands of specimens and many, many uh, specimens uh, indigenous vegetation, mainly the famous species, which we have got here in the Southern Cape, have his name, um, mainly Ericos and any other indigenous species. This is botanist of yours, you will know that. The next um, great man I would like to talk about was McNaughton. He was a real scientist, he was already trained in Oxford, and, and I think also in Edinburgh, but I've got a friend here who might help me. Um, he was, thank you, he was um, <clears throat> the first very scientifically orientated man. Vassilou was more a management man, but uh, Norton, McNaughton was a real scientist. Um, he started uh, to lay out sample plots where trees were measured every five years. And when I came here 50 years ago, he still could locate some of these old sample plots which he had started. He was also the first one who realized that indigenous trees grow very, very slowly. You probably know that in indigenous forests, the annual increment per hectare of an average indigenous forest is about one ton or one cubic meter of timber, while our commercial pine plantations and eucalyptus plantations, they produce 20 and 30 tons of cubic meter per hectare. So he realized that these forests have to be very, very carefully worked not to exhaust the timber resource and destroy the whole ecosystem. He produced the first working plan of sour flats. I don't know if you know the Oatfield Forest Station very well. This is the area where the Millwood um, uh, gold mine area was. The, the whole area to the east of Millwood um, called, is called sour flats. He introduced the first working plan in that area. But most importantly, he found a very rare tree species, the Tablans tree. I don't know who knows the Tablans tree. Who knows about the Tablans tree? Who has ever seen the Foraminic Nortonia in the Ghana forest? It's amazing. I must take you there one day. That is, that is an amazing tree. It's a beautiful tree. Um, the Foria is related to the Proteus. So it's a proteation, and it only grows on an area of about 100 hectare in the Gauna forest. You have been there, not this oh. um, It is The timber looks very much like protein timber, and it's a very kind of um, timber with a lot of oil in it. The olden days, the people used to use it uh, for the uh, boards next to the, uh, next to the saws and the sawmill. Um, an interesting tree which occurs in South Africa only on very few selected places. As I said, it occurs in Ghana on 100 hectares. The next spot where this particular tree occurs is in um, KwaZulu Natal, or on the southern area in one of the coastal forests. Then it occurs in one little patch 
south of Sabi, um, an indigenous forest. And the last one is up near uh, the downs, near Tseri, up in the present uh, the purple province. So a tree which must have been evolved many, many, many millions of years ago must have kind of occurred all over the eastern seaboard of South Africa, but with the changing uh, climatic situation, died out nearly everywhere. Only we have this insular occurrence of this particular tree. Anyhow, McNaughton found the tree and this was called after him. The next amazing man was James Cooper. He was conservator only for a very short time. But he was district forest officer for quite a long time in Leisner. And the main achievement, which I could find out, but we have got a member of the Leisner Historic Society here who knows much more about him, that he was an extremely nice guy. Um, he was very friendly with all the other district foresters and forest rangers. And he was well known and, and very highly regarded as a good person. I haven't got very much information about the personality of most of these other gentlemen. Uh, particularly, I know that uh, Fourcard and Le Vazelo and some later guys have been rather difficult to get Chapel. Thank you. Okay. Um, Stor Lister. I mentioned him, not particularly because he was very much involved with his indigenous forest in, uh, in the Southern Cape, in the Garden Route, but he was the first chief forest conservator of the Cape after de Vazelo had um, uh, was sent away in, in uh, 1992. Um, his achievement was that he promoted plantation of eucalyptus and pines. Now you might think that is a terrible thing to do, to promote eucalyptus and pines, but by doing that he created a timber resource for the growing uh, province for the, for the growing environment where the local people and the industry could draw timber from and were not any more forced to cut the timber in the indigenous forest. Um, he also started the first school of foresters in Tokai. Um, he uh, stopped again the introduction of foreign species in Forest. Unfortunately, after him came a German gentleman with the name of J.S. Henkel. He was a conservator for quite a long time in Eisner. Um, he was a great botanist, but he had worked before in Australia and had seen that the Australian blackwood, acacia, and anoxidon has got beautiful timber. When he came here uh, before the First World War, the woodcutters had denuded many, many parts of the forest. And there were gaps of the size of this room all over the place, meaning that the regeneration of the indigenous species wasn't able to continue properly because indigenous trees can only regenerate properly under some kind of cover. That's when you plant indigenous trees. Um, without a nurse stand, you hardly ever have a great success. I know um, you might not, not agree with you, you have very successful some planted some indigenous trees, but to create a forest, you need a nurse there. So, um, Dr. Henkel imported a lot of blackwood seed from Tasmania and Australia, went to the woodcutters and said, listen, um, before you chuck your tea water away in, in, in the evening, you put uh, these seeds in your warm water, let it soak overnight and sow it out in the morning. That's how we got the blackwood all over our coastal forest. From Peter's Foss all the way to George. That was the great achievement of Dr. Hank. Anyhow, um, otherwise apparently he was an amazing botanist. And he later on was kicked out of South Africa and went to Australia and became the chief forester of Australia. So he must have been a great person. <clears throat> yeah, this was the conservatives. These were people whose main objective was to take timber out of the forest without doing too much damage to it and secure the sustainability of the forest. I quickly want to mention a couple of amazing people 
who came uh, during the uh, 20th century who were putting the scientific emphasis down for the management of these forests today. The first one was John Phillips. Um, he was the first research forester in Deep Valley. You know all the, you know, the Deep Valley Forest Station. Um, he lived there for five years and published um, a, an amazing book called The Forest Succession of and Ecology and the, or Ecology in the Niza Region. This book contains all the basic research elements and data we still uh, work with today. He later on, he was by the way a great friend of, of uh, Jan Smuts. He was sent by Jan Smuts to West Africa to help a lot of forest management and ecology work over there. And later on, he became the first professor for ecology in South Africa at the University of Natal. Um, if I may mention a personal note, I had the privilege still to meet him as an old man in the late middle 80s, early, early 80s, in Natal, and could talk to him about the management of the indigenous forest. He was a great South African, not only a great forester down here. He was followed by F.S. Lawton, who also published a book which is still the basic of our indigenous forest management. He was also a research forester at Deep Valley and started a, a management um, principle, which was based on the Swiss principle, meaning if you have a forest, you don't go and cut the whole forest down. You don't select trees, but you select mainly the tall trees. The old trees, which are basically anyhow going to deteriorate and one day fall, to fall down. And um, he worked, he produced a working plan according to which these forests should be worked. It was only implemented after the war um, by uh, Dr. Donald. Um, these of you who visit local medical doctors, you know, you all know Dr. Donald. It was the father of, of Dr. Donald um, who was carrying on with the research of these forests over there. The, I must have missed something. Uh, I missed the story of the woodcutters, sorry. Um, woodcutters glorified by Dalian Matir. We all feel very much connected to these early settlers in this area. They were doing a lot of damage to the forest but they had to harvest the timber for the growing colony. Um, they had a tremendous political power because there were lots of them and they could vote for the uh, colonial parliament in Cape Town. And therefore they were tolerated and cared for. But uh, by, uh, after, the, uh, after the First World War uh, they decided, the government decided that we must kind of reduce the men, people who were working as free enterprise people in the indigenous forest. And they had to be registered. Over a thousand of them were registered and then from then on no new woodcutters were allowed to come. By the year 1939 there were only 258 woodcutters left. They were sort of pensioned off. They had got an annual pension of 25 pounds until their retirement age of 65 when they would get to get government grants. So the system of uncontrolled operation in the forest well, was, was, was basically ended in 1939. From 1939 until uh, the beginning, or the, the middle of the 1960s, the government de department of uh, forestry used very little in of indigenous forests. It was uncontrolled and some foresters cut too much, some foresters cut too little. There was very little control actually until in 1963 Fried von Breitenbach was appointed 
to be the uh, district forest officer for indigenous forest and research. His main achievement was that he collected all the information of the previous scientists and conservators, particularly from Phillips and Lawton, and produced a new system, a sustainable indigenous forest system called the Multiple Use Indigenous Forest Management. He controlled all state-owned indigenous forests from Vitaspos uh, up to uh, Reitaspos or George, and um, managed these forests according to a multiple use indigenous forest system, which means that the whole forests have to be ecologically assessed, uh, uh, type mapping of the different forest types had to be done between dry forest, moist forest, wet forest, and then management zones in these forests were, were um, surveyed, meaning either conservation purely for watershed management or fire protection, and all for research, where research sites were established, all for recreation, where picnic sites, walks, etc. Were, were made, and also for about on 25% of the area, which was declared production forest. These production forest areas, the selection system, as originally introduced by uh, Razzolo, Harrison, and later on uh, uh, further developed, was implemented for many, many years. The timber was harvested very, very carefully with uh, mules to be taken out to slip out, so little, little damage was caused to the forest. He was, uh, funny enough, not a Prussian, he was a Bavarian, um, but also a very, very strict gentleman. He was my boss for some time, so I learned a lot from him too. And he saw to it that the, men, the forest was very, very carefully and sustainably managed. After his tragic end as, of a uh, conservator of forests down here, and uh, that's not the elephant episode, some of you know, but I won't talk about that. He was sent away, and the system was further improved by many amazing uh, uh, forest uh, uh, scientists and managers. I just mentioned here uh, Professor Dr. Kurt Geldenhuis. Um, he is still a professor extraordinary professor in uh, uh, Sarsfeld and also in Stellenbosch at the Forestry Faculty and uh, Dr. Zaydak um, and a lot of other people who uh, made the system really sustainable and scientifically acceptable that today the management system of the indigenous forest has been implemented by Sam Parks now is regarded as one of the most sustainable and and conservation oriented management system of indigenous forests in the world. What about the forests, the private indigenous forests? We have got uh, quite a big extent of private indigenous forests. The biggest one probably is Parks' indigenous forest south of Deep Valley. 3,000 hectares of indigenous forests are still managed by this family company. Um, the uh, legal constraints on any harvesting there are very, very strictly controlled by the Department of Forestry, which operates in accordance to the Forest Act of 1998, which means that no indigenous trees can be harvested without a permit from the Department. So any indigenous tree, if it's basically, basically dying, will have to be visited by somebody from the Department of Forestry and then certified with a license that it can be harvested. But there's still a, sm a small amount of harvesting taking place in the sand park forest and also in some of the private forests, but it's very much controlled. And for you who have got an indigenous forest, or you know about an indigenous forest, an indigenous forest according to the Act is determined if you have got three indigenous trees which have a diameter of more than 10 centimeters standing together, it's already regarded as a forest. And you're not allowed to cut it down without a permit from the Department of Forest. What did it come down? Anyhow, um, I would like to end by uh, mentioning to you that we here in the garden are very lucky that these amazing men have contributed to the uh, 
secure existence of these beautiful forests. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much. I'm asking David or Green to say thank you, but first, questions. Anyone have any questions? So the American Medical Environmental Committee can say something about Yes, I, I can say that uh, I'm going to tell to see new environmental officer. Uh, is getting a huge amount of money from central government uh, to... Uh, uh, the idea is that all the municipal property uh, in the uh, in the flat area, or little area rather, uh, will be surveyed section for section and uh, plans will be put in place to clear them of aliens eventually. Uh, there will also be a lot of training of people at various levels. Uh, and we're talking about amounts of 10, 20 million being allocated to Peter Municipality to do this. Now, uh, you know, how well it works, one may have to see. You know, people are good at going up plans, not always so good at implementing them, but uh, at least something positive is being done. Thank you very much. Um, all upon that will read, thank the speaker, Go. Thanks, Clark. Apart from the wonderful natural beauties of Plet that we all enjoy, one of the great things about living here is the incredible people that we have in our community. We're very, very blessed to have some quite amazing personalities in terms of their abilities, their great stores of knowledge from years and years of working. And George is very prominent in that category. And we're very fortunate to have somebody of George's caliber with his great knowledge of forestry and all things to do with dendrology. And we thank you very much, George, for sharing and you've obviously done a great deal of research uh, on top of what you already knew to prepare this slide presentation for us. And we thank you very much. And um, in the words of the song, I think that I shall never see a maiden lovely as a tree. Oh. So we, let's leave it at that. Thank you, George. Let's give a big hand.